All right. So yesterday, Jeremy Howard reached out. If you don't know him, he's quite well known in the Python ecosystem and beyond for his work in AI. Uh, Fast AI is a project that comes to mind when you hear his name. But he reached out for something that's not related to that directly. He reached out because he is working on this new thing called Fast HTML together with a couple of other people. And he was curious if I was willing to give it a quick spin and then maybe also do a video um, about it. Uh, I said sure, because, you know, sounds pretty fun. Uh, but I ended up liking the package so much that uh, within a day, I also ended up making a plugin for it. So the goal of this video is to kind of motivate why I do think that there's a lot of stuff to like in this new framework. It does a few things a little bit differently. And then also kind of motivate what might be possible in this sort of somewhat new ecosystem. Now, the really short story here is that this is a Python web framework that really only needs Python. The whole point is that you don't need JavaScript or CSS. You can really do everything from Python. But this has some interesting implications, and that's something I want to dive a bit deeper into. But before we get started with that, uh, let's first discuss web apps in general and what people usually do when they talk about web apps. So to make this discussion about web apps just a bit more tangible, I figured I would open one. Uh, and here's a, a little to-do list app. What I can do is I can add something to the to-do list. I can say something like check the video. It's like something I might want to do, right? And then it gets added. And then for all of these items, uh, I am able to uh, delete them. I'm also able to edit them. So I'm uh, able to change the text. I'm also to set something to done. Uh, this is a web app. Not the most complex one, but uh, it will serve for illustrative purposes. If we start thinking about what you need to get a web app like this working, then there's a few components that you could come up with. There's the front end. This contains your HTML and maybe some JavaScript and uh, CSS. Then this front end is typically generated by some sort of back end. I'll assume Python for that. And then possibly this backend is also talking to some sort of database. Just looking at this simple web app, you might look at this and immediately recognize that already there is a bunch of stuff. If you want to make a simple to-do list over here, and if you think about the amount of Python you would need just to sort of write the logic for it, then it might feel a bit verbose that you're also forced to worry about the JavaScript over here. Maybe, oh, the CSS, do we really have to learn that? And something similar might be happening to the database over here. like. It'd be nice if we didn't also have to learn SQL in order to get this web app going. And it's kind of this feeling uh, where fast HTML really tries to make a difference. In Python, there are lots of really great web frameworks. Um, Django, Flask, Fast API for APIs. But as cool as all those tools are, you do have to learn them a bit. And kind of the vibe I'm getting from this fast HTML is that it's kind of wondering, well, if you just know Python scripting, how much web app could that already maybe generate? And turns out it's quite a bit. If you just resort on fast HTML, practically there's very little JavaScript or CSFs you might ever need to write. The feeling here should really be that you're just scripting a bunch inside of Python. And in order to achieve this, it is using a little trick under the hood that's known as HTMX. You could argue it's a relatively new package with some relatively old school ideas. I really like it. And by leveraging HTMX, uh, it turns out that you don't have to worry too much about the web technology stack anymore. So I hope that this sounds interesting. I'm going to show fast HTML in just a bit, but before doing that, I think it'd be best if I focus in on HTMX first. So that's the quick demo I'll do now. So I'm in Visual Studio Code now, and I have a little uh, HTML file open. And this HTML file contains a little snippet uh, using HTMX. If you are going to use HTMX directly inside of HTML, you would add it using this script tag over here that is going to load some JavaScript on your behalf with the goal that you're not going to be writing JavaScript uh, going forward. But then how does it work? Well, HTMX works by giving you these extra tags that you can use from HTML. And let's just read what it says here. There's a button that reads increment and it reads post and then it points me to a path. Then there's a target and it tells me that I need to swap something, the inner HTML. Notice, by the way, that this target, it has a bang in front, so that's referring to an ID. To be precise, it is referring to this span over here. And the way you should really read this is that if someone clicks this button, then it's going to send a event to a URL. In this case, it's going to be localhost slash increment. So to draw that up, the front end 
when there's a click, it is going to send a message to the backend at the slash increment URL. And then it is going to send some HTML back that can go ahead and replace some HTML on the page. Uh, and to be specific, it's going to replace this counter ID, which in the end is referring to the span that's mentioned. Hopefully this is enough context to help get the ball rolling, but the easiest way to show that this works is to actually just show you. So what I've got right here is a little Flask app, nothing special. It has this index URL that's going to render the uh, template that I just showed you, which I've got inline over here. And then I've got this other route over here, which is the increment route that I mentioned before. And that is keeping track of a counter. And this can return some text that can update the front end. And again, just to show that this works, I can hit this button that is going to call increment, which is this route that is going to return me some text. And again, if I were to look at the target, it is going to just replace the text that is inside of this uh, span over here. It's going to uh, swap the inner HTML. So every time I hit this, the back end gets pulled, but I'm able to update the front end, and that's kind of the important bit here, without doing anything with JavaScript. It is really just the back end generating HTML and the front end just knowing where to put that HTML on the page. And kind of the cool thing here is that I don't have to worry about JavaScript components or anything like that. I can really just generate whatever HTML I like using the programming language that I like, which in this case is Python. So as long as you can generate the text that represents the HTML that you want to generate, you're good. And that's a really neat thing that HTMX brings to the table. There's a lot of web apps that really don't need JavaScript anymore just because they can do uh, this all over the place. And at this point, you can wonder, well, what does fast HTML then offer? Well, in a lot of ways, it is similar to the Flask app that you just saw, but there are a few interesting differences. Just like Flask, you still get the app get thing. And just like Flask, you still define a function under the decorator that returns something. But instead of sending a string back, what you get here are proper Python objects that represent HTML elements or properties of a web page. So you can see that there's this main part of the page that I have on my home URL here. Uh, there's an H1 called count demo. We can also see that there's a paragraph tag and we see the same button that we did before. Again, you can see that we are posting to an increment URL. We have the identifier. This identifier, again, is pointing uh, to what we see over here. This bang represents an ID. So that's something we can write in code now as well. But really, it's pretty much the same app, but just a little bit more Pythonic. We don't have to worry about Jinja templates anymore. And there is a bit of benefit to having proper objects, if only for the typos. Another thing that's kind of interesting is uh, we have this serve function call down below here and uh, notes that all these components, they're being loaded because we're uh, importing all the common stuff from uh, fetched HTML in one go with this import statement. Um, but because there's this little uh, serve thing at the bottom there, uh, I should be able to just call Python name of the file. This now runs and I should be able to uh, now point my browser inside of VS Code to that URL. And lo and behold, same demo, but all of this is now written in Python. And it's here where I do think the fun really, really starts. Because um, I can do a whole lot in Python. There's lots of stuff that I can do from a Jupyter notebook. And when I have a function that just kind of works, I can kind of move that in. And especially if you know a little bit about web technology, then you can also really uh, build some custom components that are nice and reusable. So the first thing I figured I might try and do is see if I could get matplotlib to work in an interface like this. And turned out that's actually uh, not the hardest thing. So I'll show you the demo first now before diving into the code. Uh, it's very similar to what we had before, but again, I have this increment button. It's just that if I keep on clicking it now, then I have a matplotlib chart that just kind of updates. There's also, again, this count that updates, but it's this chart that I think is uh, kind of needs to have around because I do a bunch of data stuff. I do a bunch of matplotlib. The way that this whole thing works, by the way, is I have this generate chart function. Uh, inside of that, I have this matplotlib call that you would have as you would normally. But then after that, I'm doing this neat little trick where 
The image itself is captured into a buffer. That buffer is then translated into base64 encoding. And that is something I can put into an image tag. In this particular case, I'm definitely reusing some of my web knowledge. But the really cool thing here is that I just have this one function that can do a whole bunch on my behalf. And the update loop that we had is pretty much the same. There's still this increment over here. Uh, it's just that right now, every time that I'm uh, clicking the button, I'm uh, also adding some random data to a list that just gets uh, plotted kind of nicely. So that demo was pretty cool, but I figured why stop there? Because there are also other input elements that we can add. Again, as long as there is an HTML element for it, there will also be an opportunity for us to have a Python object for it. So what I did here is I added a uh, input tag that represents this slider. Uh, note, another thing that you can also do, by the way, here is uh, you can also just set the style on some of these elements and I can refresh here. So um, I can still do a little bit of CSS and JavaScript if I really wanted to. But something that I thought was particularly cool is, um, again, I can add an element here from Python and again, I can add these HTMX triggers telling it where to update and how to update. And now I don't just have a button to press, uh, I also have a slider that I can go ahead and move. And I can also just uh, update this uh, matplotlib chart. The reason why I think that that's so valuable is because suddenly a lot of that Streamlit Gradio uh, web app stuff that you might have been using before, which by the way, are those are cool projects, but it has always kind of felt that Gradio and Streamlit are in their own little walled gardens, if you will. And it makes sense because they have custom components, but sometimes you want to be able to fully customize something from Python and have just a normal web app. And it does feel, if we have sliders at our disposal, for example, that we can actually totally get there. And that's a really cool feeling. So this is really just a super high overview, and I've really only been scratching the surface here. I just hope that this is enough context to sort of help explain where all these components come from. But I do want to move towards a somewhat grand finale because I do think that here is where stuff can really start getting interesting. Because it was relatively easy for me to make this generate chart function because I was relatively well versed in web technology beforehand. I do a bunch of JavaScript in my spare time. But I can imagine um, that if you're somewhat new to web tech, but you really got a great idea for a web app, that then maybe you don't want to be bothered with stuff like this. Like if you're a great matplotlib user, maybe you didn't know about this base64 trick. I mean, I'm not gonna blame you if that's the case. But one thing I figured might be cool, just as an upgrade, maybe we should also consider plugins for this ecosystem. I have built one called fh underscore matplotlib. Uh, fh stands for fast HTML. And this plugin really only has one function, uh, matplotlib to fast HTML. Uh, what you can do is you can add a decorator to a function that does something with matplotlib. And then this decorator is going to make sure that what comes out of this function is a proper image tag that you can just go ahead and pass on to um, fast HTML. You can actually see that this function over here is also being used uh, internally over here. And again, just to show that this works, I can increment, click, 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 click. I can uh, move the slider around. But I really do think it's going to be super fun and interesting to see what kind of plugins we can come up with this. There's kind of this interesting opportunity where we might be able to come up with web components that really originate from Python. And yeah, I've made one for matplotlib real quick. Uh, I can imagine making one for Altair as well. And there is a lot of web stuff that we can maybe put into Python more. It's still very early days for this project and uh, it's very hard to predict where it'll exactly go. But I do think that this in particular is probably the most interesting bit to me. It feels like there's a lot of creativity and rethinking one can do from here. And it might also just invite a whole lot of people who are very comfortable with Python scripting to also just be exposed to the web a bit more. And I think that can be good too. I do also think that the old web frameworks are not necessarily going away anytime soon. I think it's fair to also mention that the old web frameworks are probably not gonna go away anytime soon, uh, especially Django. If I just think about all the good security practices that it brings to the table, there's a lot of stuff to like there. And I also think if you're gonna do anything with like user data, then you gotta take that very serious. So uh, maybe not immediately port everything into this ecosystem just yet. I do honestly think there's something really cool about being able to do stuff like this. Something about web components that can originate from Python. Uh, that does sound super duper cool. So I hope you enjoyed this little intro. I really only scratched the surface here. I might revisit it sometime later, uh, but I do hope that this little demo over here 
um, the fact that we can really consider some of these plugins. I do hope that that got you excited. So go out there, check out the project. And Jeremy, thanks for giving me a quick preview. This is really fun to play with.